everyone, I'm Barbara Beck and I'd like to thank you for tuning in to Welcome Home. You're going to be so glad that you're watching our program today. We're going to be talking about what to tell our children when there's a disaster, a tragedy in our lives, maybe even a mass shooting. Basically, how to respond as Christians to evil in our world. It's unfortunately a given. Evil exists and will be around until we meet our Savior face to face. So what do we tell our children and our grandchildren? How much is enough? What's too much to reveal to them? What is age appropriate? And then what about ourselves? How do we respond in a godly, productive way? We certainly don't have all the answers, but we do have a responsibility to act and react as Christians, as Christ followers. There is no set precedent for this. So we're going to be talking about it all today on Welcome Home with a licensed mental health counselor that we all know and love, Dwight Bain. He's going to help us understand from a biblically based counseling perspective, how we can guide and protect our families. But before we get to Dwight, let's see what the current ladies have to say about how they've learned to handle crisis in their own lives and even keep themselves and their families from hitting the panic button. Difficult subject, but one that we need to be discussing. Welcome, ladies. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. It's good to be with you. And we have a special guest, Kendall Natal. Thank you so much for coming. And you are a registered mental health counselor, so you have a new perspective for all of us, and you're going to be helping us from a um, from more of a uh, professional perspective. So thanks for being here. What do you think, Kendall, about some of the things that, that we've been discussing in, in the opening about what is age appropriate and how do we handle crisis with our children and grandchildren? Right. Well, thank you for having me, Barbara. Sure. Um, yeah. And when when crisis hits and when our children become aware of it, one of the things that we want to make sure that we do is gauge off of off of them. We don't want to assume that they haven't heard maybe a TV program um, or talked to other children at school and found out so about what's going on. So we want to engage them and talk to them about what's going on in their heart, what they're feeling about it. Um, I know even we as adults sometimes want to push our feelings down and it's counterintuitive, but we want to engage our children in a conversation where they can learn to, that it's a safe place to talk about what their fears are, what's concerning them about what they know um, about the situation. What a, thank you for that. That's great. What about the other ladies? I know that we've talked, Kristen, about my grandchildren, and I'll say sometimes, well, well how did you respond? How did you talk to your kids about this? What, what have been some sort of concerns that you've had about this? Um, well, I think we all know our own children, and you know the what they can handle and what they can't handle. And yeah. so the things that I'll talk to my 11-year-old about will be different from the things that I share with my six-year-old. Um, for example, when the Pulse shooting happened, um, that was very prevalent in our community. It was in our back door. And so we had a lot of conversations about that and about helping and what we could do to help the people that had been impacted and affected. Um, when Las Vegas happened, they weren't quite as aware of that. Mm -hmm. So for my youngest, we didn't, he, didn't even, he doesn't even know that that happened. And I feel like that's okay for my six-year-old to not engage in yet another shooting conversation with him. Mm -hmm. So I think really for each individual child and each family, I think as parents, we need to really just understand what we, what, where, our ch where our children are mm -hmm. and the detail with which we engage with them about some of these difficult topics. Yeah, my daughter, Gabrielle, she's 13. And when the Las Vegas shooting happened, um, she said, Mommy, why, why does all this bad stuff, why does it keep mm -hmm. happening? And it's, it's hurtful that you can't give them um, an answer to why it happens, all I can say to her is that maybe we live in a fallen world. Yeah. And until Jesus cracks the sky, yeah. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we're gonna go through things like this. Mm -hmm. um, but we have the assurance because we are believers and because God does not break a promise, he is gonna come back for us. But we just have to be steadfast and understand that mm -hmm. though this happens, it doesn't stop life, mm -hmm. you know? something beautiful will come out of it. And that's what the Bible says, Romans 8, 28. Mm -hmm. um, something good will come of it. We don't know why, we don't understand why, but I know in the, re the reassurance that God is sovereign. Yes. And though our hearts break for tragedies like this, mm -hmm. we just had one in New York the other day, um, we know that God is sovereign and he's gonna take care of us mm -hmm. um, even when we're hurting. Mm -hmm. 
But I think that is the answer. I think when we say to our children that we live in a fallen world, I think that is the answer. We're in a world that is filled with evil. Um, everybody doesn't know the same God or doesn't accept the same God that we serve. And so because of that, it makes it even more important for us to be able to talk about our faith and why we believe what we believe. Yeah. Um, my children are older, um, Kristen, and it's really funny because one half the time they're clueless. If I don't say, did you hear about because they're at school and they're doing what they're doing? So they may not hear the news, but because they're older, I will take the time to say, did you hear about this? Because I know that when they're out and about and they're at school or whatever, they're gonna hear it. And so I make the point my youngest is 16, so we have to have that conversation so that he's at least aware of what's going on around him. And a lot of times I'll say to them, particularly when uh, we can't be with them, I will say, you guys need to make sure that you take care of each other and help them to be a little bit more aware of their surroundings. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of times we just take for granted, particularly believers. Uh, we live with this thing where we just think, you know what, no matter what's going on, God is gonna protect us. Well, some of the people that end up getting caught up in these situations, they are believers. Mm -hmm. And so it happens to believers as well. Right. But I think the answer is we live in a fallen world. Um, and so no matter what age I think a child is, when you start having that conversation based on your faith, you can remind them that this is not our home. We're here, we've talked about being in exile. Yeah. Um, and we just have to deal with the tragedies as they come. Yeah, and I'm, I'm like Chris, and I've got different age children too, and I think you have to know your child. You know, my biggest thing that I always want to put into my children is not to have fear, because the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of sound mind. And so, you know, the Bible also says, lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge the Lord. And so I think what I try to do is if they come to me and they say something, I always, I say that same thing. You know, we live in a world that has fallen. There is just human nature that is, it's evil. You know, I mean, even in my own self, my flesh is awful. I, I thank God for his grace. But I also think that we have to let them know that Christ is our covering and He is sovereign and that we can trust Him. I think we really have to take the fear out of our children because, you know, I think that the enemy wants to use that on all of us is to get fearful of oh, what could happen tomorrow. And I just, I don't want to walk in that fear. I want to walk in my faith that my God shall supply all of my needs. Not that I'm not wise because He said to be wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove. But I think it's important for us as parents to reassure our children that God is still on the throne no matter what's going on around us. That's a tough balance, though, and I want to get your perspective on that, Kendall, because we want to not instill fear right. in our children, but we're still, are we helicopter parents if we protect our children and don't allow them to go to concerts? Or, you know, they're, they're just ha we just have to strike a real important balance there. How do you do that, or how would you suggest, Kendall, from a professional perspective? Well, and I think, you know, of course, as we've been talking about age appropriate and decisions that you make for what you what you allow your children to do. But, you know, we are made in the image of God and the Trinity is in fellowship with one another. God made us to have a relationship with us. And so one of the things that um, we want to do as we're navigating the fearful fallen yeah. world that we live in is to make sure that our children know that they um, have that safe connection with us. And so when they're going out to something, we want them to come to us and talk about what fears they're having. We don't want to necessarily, I mean, yes, we want to encourage them that we, that God is sovereign and he is in control, but they're smart and they know bad things happen anyway. Yeah. And so we don't want them to, to muster up this, okay, I've got to, you know, we want them to trust in God, but we also want them to take the safety of the relationship that we've created with them to come to us and talk to us about the fears that they're having as they're going about to maybe different yeah. different things where they know similar um, tragedies have happened in that type of environment. And it is such a different That's day great. and time today. You know, back in my day, we talked about stranger danger. Don't get in the car with anybody. Don't That's accept right. candy for anybody. But that was pretty much it. Yeah. You were not afraid of anybody else. You know, you could go. So I think the way that we're parenting and grandparenting today is totally different from back in my day. Well, and I think there's a difference between, if I can say this, I think there's a difference between 
instilling fear in a child and instilling wisdom. Yes. I think mm -hmm. I think you have yeah. to, to make that separation because you want your children to come and talk to you. I mean, no offense to this, I'm I tell my children, you know, you don't go over there where I can't see you. Because I want to instill wisdom in you. The Bible That's says to be wise yeah. as a serpent, yeah. gentle as a dove. And so I think there is a difference between instilling fear and instilling wisdom. And I think I'm so glad that both of you brought that up because we do need to tell our children there is things to be aware of. Mm -hmm. I mean, even me, when I'm getting out of a car, you know, I'm not on the cell phone. I'm, I'm, I'm aware. Mm -hmm. Not because I walk in fear. It's because I walk in wisdom. Yeah. Right. And I, I think we have to really differentiate what that, that looks like. Yeah. I think the other That's part good. of that is uh, um, everyone has the spirit of discernment. I think that some are stronger than others. Yeah. Um, my, uh, there's this book that it talks about the gift of fear, which is the same thing as discernment to mm -hmm. me. And, and so my children being aware when something doesn't feel right, mm -hmm. something's Good. wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. or they say your spidey senses are tingling. Mm -hmm. Something's <laughs> off. <laughs> Something is wrong there. And pay attention. When mm -hmm. God is trying to tell you and instruct you, don't go there. Don't go. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to your inner voice. And whatever the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit is speaking to you at that moment, pay attention. Because it could be truly... Uh, the difference between life and death. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing I've noticed about my children mm -hmm. is as long as I'm not fearful, yes, they're not fearful. Mm -hmm. We can have mm -hmm. open conversation, detailed conversation about incidents, but if I'm not panicking and frustrated and all of that, then they won't be. Because I think the, 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 the connection with our kids helps them. If we're good, <clears throat> they're good. But when I'm not settled about something, it just throws everything off in my house. Mm -hmm. My yeah. children will be frustrated, they will be nervous, they will be afraid because I'm afraid. Otherwise, they're good. I'm making you aware and I want you to pay attention as you're out and about. Yeah. And yes, listening to, because our children are intelligent yes. and they right. know right from wrong because we've taught them. But sometimes they are on that phone, Carolyn, mm -hmm. and they're not paying attention to what's going on around them. Jonathan is just learning, well, he'll get his driver's license um, in about a month, and he's a great driver, but I'm always saying to him, don't, don't touch the phone, mm -hmm. just leave it alone. You have to pay attention. It's not always you. It can be the other person that's mm -hmm. gonna slam into you that you won't see. So it's the same concept when you're talking about other issues. Pay attention to people and what they're doing around you. Let's say our kids are not receiving the right cues from us. You know, they're not panicking, or they are panicking, because mm -hmm. even though we're not panicking, there is some anxiety in our children yeah. that maybe we're just sweeping under the rug and saying, oh, they'll be okay, because look at me. I'm the parent, and I'm, I'm pretty cool, calm, and collected. When in fact, Kendall, they're experiencing some serious kinds of anxiety. What are some warning signs that we need to look for, especially in younger children, and maybe mm -hmm. teenagers as well, mm -hmm that might say, hmm, maybe some intervention is necessary, maybe even some s professional counseling. Yeah, yeah. Well, our children, you know, oftentimes when they're stuffing down that anxiety and not coming to us and sharing it, sharing it with us, they can have stomach aches, they can have headaches, they might become more isolated and withdrawn than what they normally are. They might become a little bit more aggressive mm. than what they normally are. And so these might be all signs of the fact that they are dealing with anxiety and trying to handle it on their own and warning signs that we need to look for, for um, to know what's going on inside them. So and as maybe a counselor, seek. you believe in seeking professional help? Uh, completely, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It kind of seems like uh, it's just how we as adults deal with stress almost mm -hmm. what you're describing mm -hmm. and that we suppress things and they'll come out in other ways. Um, we may yeah. gain weight, lose weight, um, chop somebody's head off with anger. Gain um, weight, gain uh, weight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're saying with our children, we just need to be mindful and know our kids. Like mm -hmm. you were saying, Kel uh, Kristen, Kristen. <laughs> we, we, we should know our kids. So it's... Sure. Um, I guess it's just a matter of paying attention to them. Exactly. Well, one, one story or one quote that I found has been helpful, and you all have probably all heard it, but Mr. Rogers said it um, years ago, but that in times of crisis when he was scared, his mom would always tell him to look for the helpers mm -hmm. because the helpers mm -hmm. rush in. And so with some of the things that our country's been experiencing, that's um, something I've tried to instill in my kids. Yes, this horrible thing is happening, 
but look at all the people who are rushing in to help. Look at all the people who are giving That's blood, good. collecting water, collecting mm -hmm. supplies, you know, with the hurricanes. Whatever the disaster has been, I think there's always opportunity to step out of the fear and use um, some of that, what might be fear, for good yes. by, um, good. by <laughs> being involved in some helping yeah. operation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's a great point because the, the flip side of making sure that we want to have our children share their fears with us is we want them, their, their sense of safety has been disrupted hugely and we want to show them that there's a way that we can have impact in our world and so that can be a way of of helping them use that fear to impact others for good um, so that's a great and point. I love what Deborah said it I, I love that because I think it is so important to make sure that our talk track as parents and especially as believers I was glad you said that, is to make sure that we're speaking not only truth, but we're speaking it in faith yeah. and speaking it in because that's powerful how we, I, I hear a lot of parents sometimes if they're not careful, they're speaking that fear to their children and right. those kids are repeaters. So it's, it's caught, not taught sometimes. And so I, I like what you're saying is, and I appreciate you saying that is we need to be careful and really making sure we're getting our prayer time, that we're getting our thoughts on before we're talking with our children and before we're speaking out. Because kids are listening even when we don't think they mm -hmm. are. They're listening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it's a great opportunity. You know, mm -hmm. we never want to have to deal with a tragedy. But if we're gonna if we're gonna be helpers, it's a perfect opportunity for us to be able to remind our kids that this is how we show the love of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when when you become a part of the helper, mm -hmm. It yeah. really does help children to be able to understand that, yes, we live in this world, but we are still, as Carolyn always says, we're the hands and feet mm -hmm. of Jesus. Yeah. And so. to also our response to the bad guy. You know, I think we need to be teaching our children, hate the sin. Yes, absolutely, there is evil out there, but we gotta love the sinner. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, <laughs> we're all in positions where we have been the bad guy, Yes. you know? And so I think it's real important for us as parents and grandparents to uh, elicit responses of love, regardless, and again, ways that we can help and make the situation better. Uh, we're out of time, unfortunately. I hate that, but I want us to close with at least one scripture. Does anybody have a scripture that would be appropriate for this? I got one. Okay, go. Um, John 14, 1 says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Mm -hmm. Trust in God, trust also in me. Good. Mm -hmm. I like good. That. That's a good one to end on. Kendall, Natal, thank you so much for being here with us thank today you and all of your great me. insights. And Tanika, I feel like I don't need to thank you because you're here now <laughs> so much of the time and we love having you on the Appreciate panel. Being on. And ladies, Deborah, Carolyn, Kristen, wonderful um, sharing with us today. So thank you ladies for being here. And thank you viewers for always being here with us as well. We want you to keep the these conversations going at home. Continue to talk to your children and grandchildren on ways that they can have godly responses to get fear out of their lives, but to be wise and to um, be able to know how to handle these situations because unfortunately evil does exist in our lives. So uh, we want to help you. We want to help our kids and our grandkids, and we've got more good stuff coming up. So stay with us. We'll be right back. There's a God. Mm -hmm. We've all gone through tough times. And if I know for this moment, for this next breath. You know, there's an ancient prayer to be able to breathe the name of God, Yahweh, mm. and to breathe the name of God in the middle of a crisis, Lord Jesus, Father God. You know, somebody watching right now is going through a terribly yeah. hard time, yeah. but in the middle of the hardest times, if I can breathe the name of God, if I can cling tight to my faith in Christ, God will show himself. Hi everyone, I'm Barbara Beck, host of Welcome Home, and I want to let you know how very grateful we are to you for supporting your Good Life 45 Christian station. So many of you pray for us and we really love that. You're partners with us and we consider you family. And then lots of you are our financial partners. We really need you and are so thankful for you sharing our vision to reach the world for Christ. Again, you're a vital part of our Good Life 45 family. Perhaps you out there today are wanting to be part of our ministry here at Good Life 45. Please know that no matter how small or large your gift is, if God is prompting you to be part of our family, then let me encourage you to act on it. Covering us with your prayers for continued faithfulness and strength are so important. There's nothing better that you can do for our ministry than pray. But some of you know that you can do both. You can pray and you can give. 
it's safe and secure to go to our website, goodlife45.org, and simply click on Donate or give to us by writing to the address on your screen. Either way, you're helping us continue to give you the very best in Christian and family television, television that is honoring to God. Be part of us, won't you? Thank you, dear friends, and God bless you. Oh, viewers, I'm so glad that you're here with us today because this is a super important program. We're going to be talking about crisis, continue to talk about crisis, what our response as Christians need to be. And we have an incredible mental health counselor here with us today. You know him. He's been here before, Dwight Bain from LifeWorks Group. And he's here to help us understand how we need to respond in godly ways and how we need to help our children understand what's going on in a world that is just all over the place crazy, right, Dwight? Yeah, it seems to be. Every time you turn around, yes. you know, I mean, almost every week, here's yes. another shooting, here's right. an office shooting, here's a Las Vegas shooting, here's mm -hmm. a Pulse shooting, yeah. here's a Manhattan terrorist attack. And so it seems like again and again and again, there are these acts of violence. Mm -hmm. But Barbara, when you think about it, there are a lot of crisis events in California. You know, thousands of homes, oh, homes. have been destroyed. Yes, absolutely. And so that's a different type of yeah. crisis. Or even on a small scale, mm -hmm. if somebody's in a car accident mm -hmm. and they're just sitting at a traffic light, minding their business, and mm -hmm. somebody hits them, yeah. a different type right. of crisis. Slip and fall, another type of crisis. Right. But here's what I know. Crisis can bring us closer to Christ. Mm, because in that. the middle of the crisis, and when you look at you know at the Las Vegas shooting weeks mm -hmm. ago, Every single news media outlet in the United States was saying, pray, pray, pray. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Secular news. I and know. I don't understand it. <laughs> when we do have crisis in our lives, our first response normally is to turn to God. That's right. The other, though, question I have is when we're turning to God, a lot of people will say, if God's in control, how does he let something like this happen? How do you respond to that? It's a really good question because it's interesting. You know, we live in a culture that is some people call post-Christian. Uh, when, when you and I were growing up, you know, it was about, you, you know, you knew God loved America. God bless America. And today, right. a right. lot of people are questioning that. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting in a, in a culture that doesn't really pay attention to God, when a crisis happens, who's the first person they yeah, blame? Exactly. We go to God. It's like, why would God do this? Mm -hmm. And what I've learned from reading through Scripture is that God never ever answers the question why. Hmm. When you look in the book of Job, 42 chapters, mm -hmm. horrible things happening in Job's yeah. life, but God doesn't answer the question why. And when I went to seminary, they made us count, the professors made us count the number of questions in hmm. the book of Job. And there are 277 questions that are asked. 77 of the questions are God asking Job, but at no point in time does God answer, here's why I'm doing that. So God doesn't reveal his purpose to us with why did this happen? And what I encourage people to do, parents to do, first responders to do, is to go from why did this happen to what can I do about it? Right. Because right. that one, the Bible gives us some clear direction. Yes. Psychology gives us clear direction. Here's what we can do next. Mm -hmm. There is a purpose in pain, but you won't find it in the middle of the crisis. You'll find it sometimes weeks, months, years later. Mm -hmm. The book of Job maybe took two years to, to live out in Job's life. There was eventually a why, but you don't get that in the crisis. But what you can get is, here's what to do to get through the next 60 seconds, especially when it hurts really bad. You know, Dwight, uh, that's, that's great. A lot of what I do, because I think it's so important to... To, to ask God the questions yeah. because he is there to Absolutely. hear us and to hear our hearts. And when we pray, he does minister to us. We may not get the exact answer. Right. And my, my kind of scriptural mantra with that is God's ways are not our ways. That's His right. thoughts are not our thoughts. We're never going to get it. We don't get God. We don't understand God. That's where the trust and the faith have to come That's in. Right. And we know that he's in control of everything. We don't know why he doesn't stop it. He could stop the gunman. He could stop the, um, the crisis from from happening and when somebody is about to fall or a, a car wreck or a, a child dies, he could. Why he doesn't, we don't know and we don't need to worry about it. I love how you've said that so beautifully. Move from why to what can we do as Christians. So what does our response need to be? Let's go back to, to Las Vegas, sure. that, that, as you said, happened several weeks ago. How are we supposed to respond 
to that situation as, as parents teaching our children how to respond? Well, as parents, uh, most parents like me, my kids are college age, I've been the dad who said, here's money to go to the concert. Yeah. You know, when you right. think about the Ariana Grande bombing in oh, Manchester, yeah. England. Yeah. You know, I've been the dad who said, here's money to buy a T-shirt. You meet me at this corner after mm -hmm. the concert. Because until a certain age, they don't drive. And so a parent yeah. takes them. It's every, it's every parent's yeah. nightmare. Right. And so when that happens, we, f we immediately go to a feeling of shock. Mm -hmm. I can't believe this happened in our culture. But here's a hard reality that we all have to make peace with. This is not the America we grew up in. No, that's true. There are dangerous people yeah. who want to do dangerous, destructive things. Mm -hmm. uh, there are political parts of that that don't matter in a crisis. Because yeah. in a crisis, it's just about there was a bombing, there was a shooting, there was a terrorist attack. So what can we do? With my older kids, I want them to get involved. I want them to move from, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened, to let's go get involved. If they're old enough, they can give blood. We can certainly mm -hmm. donate time. Mm -hmm. I like donating time and volunteering more than I like donating money. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes mm -hmm. it's too easy to say, well, here's $10, and then here's the crisis, and I don't have to think about it. Because I believe that as, as Christ followers, in the middle of a crisis, that's when people of faith shine. Yes. In the middle of a crisis, yes. that's when we show up. And so uh, in Las Vegas, when we saw the huge prayer meetings and, and, and the local media all saying, hey, here's a prayer vigil, here's a candlelight vigil, everybody show up. Yeah. Because the harsh reality, Barbara, there were 58 funerals, mm. 59 funerals. Mm. And when you start to look at that and you go, oh my goodness gracious, there were hundreds of people in hospitals, yeah. which means hundreds of opportunity for people in Nevada, people in, in Arizona, people in California, people in Oklahoma, my friends in Texas, New Mexico, mm -hmm. who said, we're going to go and serve. Mm -hmm. And when people say, why are you doing this? There's the why. Yeah. We come right. back to the what. Yeah. I believe that Jesus Christ changed my life, and here's what we do as believers to help you. Yeah. Well, we saw it here in Central Florida after the hurricanes. Yes. People that just showed up with chainsaws and rakes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they said, we do this because Christ right. says, serve your community. Right. And when we become the hands and the feet of Christ, people are willing to listen to our message. Yes. And until we get involved in that act of service, Sometimes people are not interested in the message. Right. So in the middle of the crisis, remember, we can see Christ, but we see Christ through each other and through acts of service. Yeah, that's great. Dwight, so let me ask you this question. As a parent of teenagers, and there'll be a lot of parents out there listening and, and watching today wondering, with all that's going on out there, and we, it is a different world. It's not the world that we grew up in, <clears throat> where we go outside and play at night and come in when the street lights go in. That exactly. was, those were the parameters that we had. Don't get in the car with a stranger. It's so much different today. Do we continue to allow our kids to go to concerts, or do we live in fear? Do we protect them? Do we rein them in? I mean, there's got to be a balance here, but we also need to change our parenting a little bit, too, to protect our kids. Well, we really do, and so nobody's going to be, you know, you know willy-nilly, just go anywhere you want. We're going to pay attention. And it, when you look at terrorist activity, they pick big, what are called soft targets, places mm -hmm. where people aren't anticipating an attack. Yeah. So if you're going to the Super Bowl, if you're going to the Olympics, you pay attention to your surroundings. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to a big concert, you just pay attention mm -hmm. more than we used to. Yeah. You know, before we never really thought about it. And now we need to think about it. But back, back mm -hmm. to your question. Yeah. Should we just stop? Absolutely not. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Terrorists want to make people terrified and afraid. Yes. And if we live terrified and afraid, it's kind of a violation of the number one theme throughout Scripture. Yeah. The Bible says, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Remember, in Israel today, they have to deal with terrorism. They have to deal with threats. Mm -hmm. Their culture, since it began, mm -hmm. has been about we have to move forward in spite of the fact that these bad people want to do bad things. And when something happens, we're not going to live in fear. It's actually some really exciting research about resilience. When somebody says, these are terrible things, but you know what? We're going to move forward. Like we saw with England in the bombing of the Blitzkrieg in World War II. Mm. They were bombed every mm -hmm. night, yeah. and yet they kept moving forward. Right. And the Germans, the Nazis, didn't anticipate, mm -hmm. what do you mean they're going to just keep moving forward? No, you're supposed to be scared and give up. Mm -hmm. And the British people said no, and they literally were able to stop Hitler for years until the United States got into the battle. 
they became more resilient. Mm -hmm. They got stronger. It's, it's a concept called PTG. You're familiar with PTSD, Post Traumatic yes. Stress Disorder. Right. And that's very real and it, it causes self-destruction. 23 veterans every day die from suicide because of PTSD. Mm. But if you reverse that to go to the other side, PTG is Post Traumatic Growth. I've never heard of that. Right. That's great. And so resilience, when you yeah. think about it in scripture, yeah. you know, my friend Pat Williams, who I know you've had on the show yes. from the Orlando Magic, Pat's in my life group, mm -hmm. and Pat had cancer. He was diagnosed almost seven years ago with multiple mm -hmm. myeloma, bone cancer. Yes. And, and Pat now says, you know, if I had it to do again, listen, hmm. he said I'd pick cancer. Mm. He said because of the opportunities it's given me to share faith in Christ on wow. ESPN, yeah. ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN. He mm -hmm. said everywhere I go people say, how are you doing with cancer? And he'll say, Jesus Christ yeah. changed me, God healed me. There's no explanation for how he is living today yeah. in full remission, cancer free. Right. So he said cancer opened a doorway. You know, who would say if I had it to do again, I'd pick this path. Yeah. See, now he can see the purpose in the pain. Right. That's PTG, that's post-traumatic mm -hmm. growth. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people after a major crisis yeah. will say, you know what, this happened, but here's where I saw God intervene. Here's how I saw God come in and give us a new opportunity after an unexpected yeah. death, after right. some kind of a crisis. What if it doesn't happen, Dwight? Sometimes you're not able yeah. to see it in this lifetime. That's true. What, what do we do with that? And that's where, I love what you said earlier, that's where our faith comes in. Okay. Lord God, I don't understand this, but even, <laughs> I don't have to understand it to accept that you are my God, you are mm -hmm. faithful, you are able, and you will give me grace. When the Master said, pray this way, give us this day our daily bread. Barbara, there are people watching that have lost a job, they've lost a home. Mm -hmm. Life is not going well for them. And they say, where is God in the middle of my economic crisis, right. my financial crisis? There's a God. Mm -hmm. We've all gone through tough times. And if I know for this moment, for this next breath, you know, there's an ancient prayer to be able to breathe the name of God, Yahweh, mm -hmm. and to breathe the name of God in the middle of a crisis, Lord Jesus, Father God, you know, somebody watching right now is going through a terribly yeah. hard time. Yeah. But in the middle of the hardest times, if I can breathe the name of God, if I can cling tight to my faith in Christ, God will show himself mm -hmm. in this lifetime, maybe at a funeral. You know, the stories that I've heard sometimes, you know, a, a person found a letter they shared with me. They said, when my father died, I found this letter. I had no idea what he was going through. My friend Florence Littower talks about how that her dad was a gifted musician, but he never did anything with it. Mm. And she found a little box behind his piano after he died. And it was a little box where he kept little, little notes, little, little dreams that he had. And she said, my father died with his dreams still inside of him, but he had to work. It was the Great Depression. Mm. He had to take care of us. He couldn't pursue a career. And so she said, everybody needs to be able to open their little silver boxes and say to their friends and, and, and the people that they work with, their neighbors, I don't know what you're going through, but I want you to know I appreciate you. I value you. You see, after a crisis, Barbara, we see the best in people. We see the worst in people. Absolutely. Some people get really weird, say horrible things. Mm -hmm. They deserved it. You know, I've heard that sometimes, mm -hmm. and I think, you don't understand compassion and empathy because you've never lived through crisis. Mm -hmm. If somebody's lost a loved one, yeah. we saw this after the pulse shooting, and I heard people say some horrible things. And I thought, you know, you've never had to bury your daughter. Mm -hmm because my daughter, who works for uh, an entertainment company here in Central Florida, had been invited to that place many times for birthday parties. Mm -hmm. My daughter didn't deserve to die. Her best friend was there that night. Yeah. She didn't deserve to die. She went to a party to celebrate somebody else's birthday. Exactly. So after a crisis, you know, a plane crash, well, you know what? They shouldn't have been traveling there. So when you hear people say snarky, mean, hateful things, what they're telling you is they've never lived through a crisis. Yeah. Because if they buried a loved one after a sudden, you know, after a terrorist attack, mm -hmm. the terrorist attacks of 9-11, you know, when you see somebody who's able to, to, to share their pain, they've got an empathy. And that's when God can sometimes use broken vessels. Uh, I heard yeah. Rick Warren reached out to Pastor Joel Hunter after Joel's son committed suicide. And Rick Warren's son committed suicide. Right. And he right. said, you're in a club you don't want to be in. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I understand. 
And so if somebody's watching and they've buried their son or daughter yeah. after a suicide and they have that most horrible crisis of burying one of their own children, yeah. they understand. And as we heal through the grief, as we heal through the crisis, we now have so much grace to be able to give to others who've buried a son or a daughter. If somebody's lost a loved one who drowned, you can reach out to other people. So as we heal from our pain, maybe you've gone through a bankruptcy or a foreclosure like Dave Ramsey. And so Dave now spends so much yeah. of his time talking to other people right. who've gone through bankruptcy and foreclosure to be able to say, I get it. I understand your pain. Yeah. Here's what to do. And so Barbara, we always keep coming back to, here's what to do next. Here's what to do next. Here's what to do next, because I, I believe strongly if I can give people tools, mm -hmm. they can figure it out. Well, let's talk about a tool that you've done here that I think is so rich. It's traumatic reactions in children, strategies for parents and teachers in being able to help kids respond in a right way to crisis. I, I love the moving forward, and that's what you're so good at, Dwight. You help people Thank to you. have some positive steps to, to heal and to be um, restored. So where can, what, first of all, what is, it, what is it about? What are some of the um, reactions that children have, let's say either to the, to the new, since this is so recent, New York or to the Las Vegas um, concert attack, how should children be, parents teaching um, their children to respond? All right, so let's think about, um, we'll call school age. Yes, uh, okay, right? elementary. Right, so let's mm -hmm. go with first grade. If they're younger than six, mm -hmm. they don't need to know about it. At all? At all. Okay. So I don't want, you know, five-year-olds, kindergartners, because I want okay. their innocence to Good. be shielded and protected. What if they hear about it? What if somebody doesn't Well, they're going to hear, hear about it. They are going to hear about it. They're going to hear about it. Then what do you do? And that's when, you know, I say to a six-year-old, honey, bad people do bad things. Okay. And, and let that be it. in a far-off land called Las Vegas. Okay. And we don't live there. In fact, you've never even been there. Don't be afraid. Okay. Very Good. small children, Good. really up until about third grade, mm -hmm. they hear something, but then they look to mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And if mom and dad are not freaked out, yeah. then they're not freaked out. Yeah. If they see that grandma's freaked out because she's watching the news continually, mm -hmm. but nobody that we know was there. I mean, they think like ripples, right? Right. So here's the impact zone of a trauma. We'll use Las Vegas. Okay. All right. So here's the impact zone. Mm -hmm. If my friend, my family, my loved one, my coworker was there, shot, injured, mm -hmm. right, we're directly involved. Our right. family is directly involved. Right. For some reason, God said, you're gonna go through this. Mm -hmm. The next circle would be, I know someone, you know, right? Like my daughter after the pulse, she knew someone. Yes. All right. so let's go to the next circle. I don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who knows anybody. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be real involved. And okay. here's where we can see something called secondary traumatic stress. Even though uh, after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, there were a lot of people that were traumatized because they kept watching the news mm -hmm. from the impact zone. Mm -hmm but they lived in Nebraska and they'd never been to New York City. Mm -hmm. But they felt like they were there. But they felt like yeah. they were there vicariously right. through the media. Yes. All right. And so particularly with senior adults or with small children, mm -hmm. I really want them to be able to turn off okay. some of the news media because it's not going to help you, mm -hmm. but it can traumatize you. Now, when mm -hmm. we deal with older children, you betcha, we're gonna talk about. So what, third grade on maybe? Yeah, I'd say third grade when we get into middle school. Okay. And, and we're gonna talk about bad people do bad things. There are okay. terrorists in the world. They try to scare people. Okay. We need to be aware of our surroundings. Remember when we went to the fair and remember how I was kind of watching and we said, that guy looks a little creepy, let's go this way. Yeah. Because honey, I want you paying attention to your surroundings. And trust your instincts as parents Absolutely. too. Do your homework, yep. read things like this, you know, listen to programs like this, um, but then trust your instincts as a parent. Dwight, you counsel people every single day. How, and yet you're, you've, you've had, and I don't wanna, wanna say this flippantly at all, but you've had a pretty charmed life, right? Not <laughs> a lot of crises? Oh my, no. No? No. Yes, you have or no, you have not? I've had so many crises. You've had. I just, okay. here's how life works. You're either in a crisis, you just yeah. came out of a crisis, yeah. or buckle up, buttercup, you're about to go into a crisis. <laughs> well, that's true. That's so true. we've had different crises than other people. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there are periods of time for years at a time. It's like, Lord God. And so what happened in okay. this part, in the major crisis part, okay. I saw God's favor. Mm -hmm. No question. Okay. I saw opportunities. I and mean, we've gone through so many challenging times. So does that give you more empathy to yep. have having been through all of these things with your clients? 
Well, it gives me more empathy to be able to say uh, a basic principle. If you talk through it, you can get through it. Okay. Because what I learned is you have to talk on a couple of levels. Mm -hmm. I have to talk to my, my, my family, my wife, you know, the people that were immediately involved in the crisis. Yes. You know what? Nobody wanted cri cancer. Right. Cancer comes to every zip code. Right. Nobody wanted this, but you know what? All right, so here's in, in the crisis, we're talking. We're talking to our friends and family. Mm -hmm. We're talking to God. That's, an important, that's the most important level. Right. Lord God, please be with us. Mm -hmm. And I want to see people journaling. Okay. You know, one of the most powerful right. things that people can do, they get out a pen mm -hmm. and they write. And people say, mm -hmm. yeah, I know I should. When you think about the Psalms, it's basically David's journal. Yeah. David was running Crying out to God. from his yeah. own father-in-law. Yes. You know, you think you have bad in-laws yeah. at Thanksgiving. <laughs> Man, King David's father-in-law was trying to actually kill him. Right. And so he writes the Psalms, and as he's writing and pouring out his pain to God, his faith grows so much stronger. Mm -hmm. So everybody, yes, I've had great favor, right? You're in the crisis, you're coming out of the crisis, or buckle up, you're going in. Mm -hmm. I certainly have had so much, so many blessings in my life. But God's also allowed some horrible things that made no sense. Sometimes because of you know bad choices and sometimes yeah. bad choices other people made and sometimes just catastrophe nobody could see coming. Right. But but I know this, it rains on the just and the unjust. Yeah. And if you're not in a crisis now yeah. and you're on this part where you're about to go in, go help somebody who's in a crisis. But God uses this process to be able to equip all of us to show what faith in the world is about. Mm -hmm. Fewer people than ever go to church but more people than ever face different crisis events. Yeah. And when they can see people like you and me living out our faith when there's a miscarriage, living out our faith when there's a horrible car wreck and somebody's killed or they're permanently handicapped, when you start to look at, this doesn't make any sense, but we live through some type of blood disorder mm -hmm. and other people see it and they'll say, I don't know how you get through. And that's when we can say, it's because of my faith in Christ. Right. Got a minute? Let me tell you a story about a man who changed my life. Yeah. He can change yours too. That's right. So what are some warning signs that we can look for, Dwight, in either our children or maybe even our spouse or, sure. or people in our circles of influence that we think that the trauma has affected them. They're living in fear. They're living without peace. Um, they're worried about everything all of the time. What are some things that we need to be looking for? And then what can we do about that? Right. So young, old, middle age, we're looking for major changes in behavior. Somebody okay. who's weepy, somebody who's very um, uh, terrified. They're afraid to go outside. They're afraid to get on a plane because okay. there might be a terrorist attack. Remember, if you talk through it, you can get through it. Okay. So I'm looking for emotional symptoms, behavioral symptoms. I'm looking for spiritual symptoms. Mm -hmm. Somebody who used to have strong faith in God and now they're really, really mad at God. Mm -hmm. And as I start to look at yeah. these and including physical symptoms, number one being sleep. Mm -hmm. When somebody has normally been okay with sleep and now their sleep is deeply troubled or their appetite is deeply troubled or their energy is really affected. Okay. What's happening is their body is giving us warning signs. Mm -hmm. In fact, the packet that you talked about, there's a yes. list of about 60 okay, different good. warning signs young or old, mm -hmm. and 60 different coping skills that people can use to be able to take a big breath okay. and remember, somehow, God, I know you're going to work through this. I don't see it now, but I trust you yes. that you will carry us through. And he is faithful Absolutely. and he will. Absolutely. And he gives us his peace. I think it's really important for us to talk about that word. We only have a couple of minutes left, but to understand that Part of why Jesus came, besides the eternal life, which is huge, he came to give us peace. That's right. In the midst of all the strife and the turmoil and the chaos and the, the trauma that's all around, the crises that happen all around us every day, God came to give us his peace. And so how do we appropriate that peace in a minute or less, Dwight? Tell us sure. how to get Jesus So remember, peace. the master's teaching his disciples. He knew that he was going to be taken away. And he said, guys, in this world, you will have trouble. Mm -hmm. Be of good cheer. I overcame the world. Mm. What I want people to know is that crisis events will come. Yes. It's going to happen. And, and, and even though we don't want it to, even if you hide under your bed, 700 people a year yeah. slip and fall and die in the bathtub. Mm -hmm. You can try to play it safe. Yeah. <laughs> but if I'm able to say, Lord God, you put me in this situation, I don't know why, but I will trust you and I will live out my faith. I'll talk about my faith. I'll go deep in my faith and look at the common denominator, faith, faith, faith. Mm -hmm. Jesus said the world's yeah. going to have problems, but I'm bigger than the world. 
hold on to me. And that's what you and I can do, Barbara, in the middle of any kind of crisis. Thank you so much, Dwight Bain, licensed mental health counselor. I'm so glad that you came across Thank our you. path today to help us and to really redirect our thoughts and our minds back to Jesus and the peace that he gives us. Yes, in this world, we will have trouble. But the reason that he came was so that we would be able to trust him and to have the peace that he wants for all of us, that peace that passes understanding. Amen. If you want more information about Dwight Bain and his ministry, you can go to lifeworksgroup.com. Or if you want to get this incredible resource free of charge over your internet, you can go to that uh, website. You can call us here at the station. Go to our website as well. It's Traumatic Reactions in Children. These are strategies and psychological coping strategies from Dwight Bain to help us understand how to go from step one to step two to step three to step four to finally to be able to be restored and redeemed and to have that kind of uh, victorious life in Christ that we all so desperately want. We've got more coming up, so stay with us and we'll be right back. What's cooking, viewers? I'm in the kitchen today with the one and only John Rivers from Four Rivers Smokehouse and The Coop. And we're going to be cooking something really special today from The Coop as a special special, right? As a special special, yes. yes. Actually, this is a wonderful recipe that was made by Whitney when she was with yes. us, Whitney Miller, for about mm -hmm. a year. And she helped me develop recipes. And this one came from her and where she grew up in uh, Mississippi. Okay. So this is a very light, um, uh, nice um, bisque that you uh -huh. can make with shrimp. Good. Okay? Shrimp and bisque. So I thought that was Louisiana. No? Oh, uh, a bisque? Oh, yeah, it certainly is. But okay. Louisiana, Mississippi, they're pretty good friends. They're pretty close, yeah, right? They, they get along quite a bit. So we're going to make a roux, okay. kind of like what we did last time. Mm -hmm. And a roux is half oil, okay, yes. and half flour. Right. And as long as the ratios are the same, you know, it'll come out really nice for us. So the roux is going to be our base. And this is the same thing that you use when you make um, uh, gumbos. Right. Okay. Right. And there are, I think, there's seven different colors or shades of a roux. Oh, wow. Depending on how dark you want your base okay. to be. And what controls the shade is how long you let it cook yes. for. Now, yes. the biggest mistake that people make when they make a roux is they do this. They, they turn around and they mm. start doing something else. And you can never do that. This guy will burn so fast on you. Okay. You know, I like to keep it at a medium heat. Uh -huh. But if you can't control it, if it gets out of hand on you, you know, lower it down a little bit. Okay. Let it simmer, you know, and get back to where it needs to be. And then you can add it, turn it right back up. Okay. So this is, you know, this is the number one area that most people will mess up when they're making um, a, a bisque or right. they're making a gumbo. But you got to have a nice thick base. So what the ratio though is how much oil to how much flour? One to one. One to one. Yeah. Okay. It keeps it really super easy to okay. remember. You see how dark yeah. it's already getting? It's beautiful. And you had some onion in there too, right? I did. I like to okay. uh, season it a little bit. Mm -hmm. I put some salt and a little bit of onion. Okay. And I use butter today. Nice. You can either use butter or you can use oil. If, if there's a choice, I'll always choose butter. Yeah, absolutely. Over oil. I love my butter. See how nice and clumpy That's it's getting? That's looking really good. Yes. But people think, oh my, it's, it's too much flour or it's too dry. But no, you actually want that. Okay. Because to this, we're going to add an awful lot of uh, liquid to it. Okay. What okay. kind of liquid? Uh, let's go ahead and start with that cream that you have. Is this right like there. heavy whipping cream? Uh, yeah. Just, that, uh, okay. that's, that's just like a, uh, it's uh, just a heavy milk. You can use a milk if you wish, if okay. you want to keep it on the light side. And go ahead and put that and in And by slow. the way, we will have all of these recipes. And anytime we have a, a John Rivers cooking segment, we'll always uh -huh. have the recipe up for you on our website or on our Facebook. Is that too much? Or am I doing no, okay? it's all going to go. Okay. Oh, it's all going to go. Yeah. But okay. it, you're doing it perfect, nice and slow. Okay. And see how I'm just continuing to incorporate yes. the milk into the cream, into the flour, mm -hmm. into the roux? Mm hmm And that way, it also get, it, it avoids having big clumps. Yes. yes. The dumplings, that I call them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the dumplings, yes. Right. I'm really good at dumplings. Okay. Now, as you're doing that, I'm going to turn it up high. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Look at that. It is smelling so good. I wish our viewers could smell this. <laughs> mm. Right. Now, let's go ahead and throw in... Um, the sausage there. Okay. Sausage? Okay, yes, what please. kind of sausage is this? I use a smokehouse sausage. Okay. So a lot of the recipes from the coop are really a combination of ingredients and some core recipes. Okay. You know, but that you will... just chop them up into little tiny pieces. Yeah. And there. this is smoke sausage. You, know, you can use an andouille. Um, you can use something, you know, if you want some, you want some 
um, earth to it. Okay. You don't want it to Substance. be a breakfast yeah. one because you don't right. want syrup and stuff in here. Right. Let's go ahead and keep putting everything. Everything. Let's put our spices. That's All a little right. cayenne. Cayenne pepper. Yep. Okay. There we go. Looks like about a fourth of a teaspoon, but again, we'll have that uh -huh. recipe. Go ahead and put um, our garlic. Garlic. Very little garlic. Very little. You don't want it to dominate the flavor here. Okay. You want to keep it light, mm -hmm. you know, for this is a nice. And uh, you seem to always use coarse sea salt. Right? I do. Okay. I do. I just, uh, you know, I got used to that early okay. and just kept using it. All right. Go ahead and so, yep, those. Corn? Sure. Now, corn. this corn looks like it's already been cooked. It looks that like has, it's roasted. I grilled the corn. You grilled yeah, the corn. Yeah, I like it. gives it a little bit more bite to it, <laughs> a little more flavor. You're amazing. Now look how thick we're getting here. Isn't I love it. I love it. Yes. Okay. All right, now, these are smoked tomatoes. I, and, you know, you can just use canned mm. tomatoes. But how do you smoke tomatoes? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we take the whole tomato, we actually throw it in the smoker. Okay. For about uh, half an hour to an hour. But can you buy them smoked? Mm, I, not that I know of. All right, so this just is kind of a... Can, uh, use a canned one, and it does just this fine. Is going to be a recipe that is going to be better when we go to the... <laughs> Would you please put a tomato Sorry, all right, there. tomatoes, tomatoes, there we go, tomatoes. Stop talking and cook, right? So we're doing great. Now, all right. see, it's too thick. Okay, so now, this is one of the secret ingredients, that little orange there. Oh, it looks that, like Velveeta cheese. That is a shrimp stock. <laughs> Don't buy Velveeta okay? cheese for this. So you shrimp can, stock. Shrimp stock. Got it. Yes, okay, you can put, am I ready? Yes, you can put water in, but Ooh. if you put shrimp stock, it's going to carry a lot of flavor. Yes. You see how that loosens it up? Okay. And now, you buy shrimp stock, or do you have to make it? Oh, uh, either. Okay. Either. Thank you so much. That's perfect. I've never seen shrimp stock at the grocery store, uh, but you can it buy is it. There. Yes, okay. it is there. You can buy it. Okay. Okay. Now, what you would do is let this cook down for about 15 to 20 oh, okay. minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's going to thicken, and yes. all the flavors are going to come together. Now, you notice one thing that's not in here is a shrimp. No shrimp. Okay? Right. So the shrimp is actually going to go at the very end once you got this to like a nice so little boil. So it won't get tough, right? right? If you put yes. it in too, oil, or too, too early, early it yes, that's, tough. yep, you'll yes. absolutely lose it. So, right. you know, you're going to put it in raw, mm -hmm. but for what we're doing today, okay, this is what the, the soup or the chowder actually product. looks like, yes. the bisque does, and I've got some shrimp over here. You gotta have shrimp in your in your shrimp best, don't you? Now you're not shy about putting some of that water in there because the water's flavored too, I suppose, right? Um, for you can uh, okay. for for today for us moving quickly like we were. Now I like to top it off with something just a little special. Of course. So I get like a little grit cake. Lovely, you know, lovely. Put that in the middle. Okay. And then a little garnish. Know, a little garnish. A little spring onion there. Isn't that pretty. That's gorgeous. And I'll go with that. Nice. I cannot wait. Unveil. I don't know what I want to eat first. Do I want to <laughs> eat the grits cake? And and viewers are going to want to know how you do that. Can you show them that little contraption? Sure. So I would have no idea how to do. I fix grits for my mother all the time. So take grits. But you take grits. Okay. Um, lay them out in a, a plan, a pan. Okay. So they lay flat. Let them get cold. Oh. Once they get cold, okay. we're just going to use a little uh -huh. you know, biscuit cutter. cooker yeah. Yeah. and just cut them out. And you can do any nice. shape you want, and then I just did a light fry on it. All right. Bon appetit to bon myself. Bon appetit. Mm. Mm. Isn't that mm. nice? Very light Yum. for a bisque. Mm. What's so crunchy? What am I eating this crunchy? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows, right? <laughs> mm. John. Delicious? That's really good. Yeah. I'm going to try just yep. because I need to. Need to try your um, grits cake. That nice. Yeah. That, I could just that, sit that here it, yeah. and eat this for the next half an hour. The whole bowl. Oh, it is so. This is probably one of my favorite things you've ever Isn't made. That delicious. Has a little kick to it. Great flavor. What now? Would we, we would eat this in the summertime? In the wintertime? Doesn't do. matter, right? No, it's made to be it's a little a summer lighter dish than for you. Yeah, but okay. um, you can make it thicker and make it a winter hearty one too. That is delicious. Thank right. you so much for being here, viewers. You will be able to get this recipe from our Facebook or from our website. John Rivers from Four Rivers Smokehouse and the Coop. <laughs> Wonderful dish for us to try. Hope that you enjoyed the segment. Thank you so much You're for being here welcome, with us dear. today. Stay with us, viewers. We have more coming up. I hope you got a lot out of our program today. It's not easy to acknowledge and talk about all that's going on in our culture. But listen, we've got to discuss difficult topics with our families so that we can hopefully better prepare them for when they face challenging times. Jesus told us in scripture, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. 
I mean, sometimes it seems like evil has overcome the world, but don't be deceived. Our Lord is in control. He's with us through it all. His hand controls power and might. He rules this world. So why then is there so much pain? Why is there evil? This is no surprise. God told us there would be evil. We have to live in a world where we wrestle against powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual host of wickedness. But what do we do? Scripture tells us to get ready for this war. Put on your armor, be strong, stay firm, fight the battle, and of course, pray. I pray the blood of Jesus to cover my loved ones every single day. And I believe that God does that. My daughter asked me just the other day, didn't Job have the blood of Jesus over him? Well, why wasn't he protected? I'm not sure anybody on this side of heaven has all the answers. In fact, God tells us that his ways are not ours, nor are his thoughts our thoughts. But we live faithfully. We trust God and we do the best that we can, knowing that after this little vapor of a life is over, we will spend eternity with our Savior and Lord, our Heavenly Father in paradise, where evil will no longer exist, where there will be no more weeping, no pain, no sickness, nothing but fellowship with God and our loved ones. And that, dear friends, is our note of hope for today. Thanks so much for joining us and God bless you.